Okay. All right. Hello, salam, shalom, namaste, sasrikal, aloha, hola, ciao, bonjour, buna, privet, babuhai, and jean dobre. It's really, really good to be with you again. And I know you'll be so happy you've joined us because we have a really wonderful guest with us. And it's Anna Dobos, who's an author and other than being an author, she's a relationship and trauma therapist. Welcome, Anna. Oh, hi, Sam. Yes, thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I'm so excited about this conversation. Oh, me too, me too. And before we really get into the conversation, Anna, please tell us more about who you are and what you do. Yeah, I was born and raised in Hungary, um, so English is my second language, and I moved to Canada, Vancouver. I'm a Vancouver-based therapist. I moved eight years ago, and um, so it's my, it was my choice. So I, I love this country because it was my choice, and I love um, mo uh, this multicultural background, diversity. So when I talk about myself, I think that maybe that's one of my one of my main characteristics that i i chose to be in an environment where uh, we are from different countries with different gender identities and uh, and i work with people who were with a very diverse population and my passion is to find a shared humanity underneath uh, the different beliefs the different layers and and help people recognize that who we are that we 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 are one big human family underneath all the different shapes and forms and colors and 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 uh, stories mm -hmm. um so that that should that that's the basic idea i work with couples since i wrote my book uh relationship matters uh, I mostly, mostly work with people who suffer trauma and with couples, and uh, I'm, I'm super passionate about that. Oh, I love it. I love it. And thank you so much for sharing something of your personal story with us also. And I can definitely relate to it. My family has also moved around America where I'm living now. This is the fourth country, actually, that I'm living in. Um, and it really does shape you and influence you when you make a move um, and you go through the process of making a new home and a new place and a new culture. But at the same time, it's like the, the place where you have lived before or where you were born and raised, it also continues to be a part of you. And it's uh, it's so interesting, um, I think, to learn to bring those different um, identities of ourselves together and find a place of harmony inside of ourselves with those uh, different aspects of our lives and our identities. Yeah, it's it's really tricky because when I arrived, I had certain beliefs about myself. Mm. And I truly believe that okay, this is who I am. I'm not a sport really sporty person. I I'm not a, like as a woman coming from Hungary, I had certain beliefs. Mm -hmm. And then arriving to uh an environment where women are treated very differently mm. and there are different opportunities and beliefs about women, I discovered that, wow, all, all, like so, so, some of the, the things that I believed about myself are not true because when I experience myself uh, in this new environment with different people and they perceive me differently, yes. Uh, I, I I discovered that wow maybe there are new colors in me. I mean, this is this is so it's very interesting what you say that yes we integrate our own culture and then we discover new new things about ourselves. So 
I think that maybe personality is kind of fluid because it's a construct construct depending on the environment, the stories we we experience and we receive. So it's such a such a big topic what personality is. Yes. Or identity is. Yes. I agree with you. I agree with you. I think, you know, moving around with my family across different cultures has actually been one of the things that um, has definitely shifted my personality. But as a trauma survivor, it was also one of the catalysts for my healing and growth and my ability to actually um, gain better uh, insight into what I was experiencing and uh, definitely in terms of what options were available to me um, for reaching out and getting help. So I, I will, uh, for example, um, I remember um, the first move that we made was uh, my family, we, we were living in a small town in India, and then we moved to Dubai. Uh, this was back in the early 1990s. And, uh, you know, for us, it was like a huge change, uh, nonetheless, because in India, we were living in a joint family system. As I mentioned, it was a smaller town. And, um, you know, things like, um, 24 7 running water and electricity were luxuries for us you know and but it was normal to experience these things in in Dubai and in Dubai was the first time where I also um, was uh, my parents worked really really hard to get me admitted into the best school that they could and this was the first time I was in a school where there was this library that they had now. I mean, if I look at it from my grown-up perspective now, that library was not the biggest library in the world. But to me, it was like my first time having access to as many books uh, as mm -hmm. there were. And we were actually required in school to uh, read at least one book every week. And so that's how I first discovered my love for reading. And that became a huge point of like, um, you know, because the trauma that I survived is child sexual abuse. And so actually reading became my best coping mechanism because it allowed me to, you know, just kind of forget my own life and my own problems and just uh, forget, uh, forget myself and just focus on, you know, the books that I was reading, the characters I was reading about, because mostly I was reading, you know, young adult uh, or even children's books and things like that, um, being only about nine years old at the time. But that was, you know, if my environment hadn't shifted, that new possibility would not have opened up. And with every move that I've made, you know, I can immediately think of other breakthroughs that I made or other things that opened up for me in the context of my trauma healing, you know. So it's been really amazing that way. Hey, thanks for tuning into this episode. Hope you're getting value out of it. For your information, this episode has been sponsored by the Happiness 101 program. Are you a change maker, coach, trainer, or healer? Are chains of fear holding you back from making the impact and income you desire? Using a unique combination of positive psychology and the spiritual wisdom of our most effective change makers, the Happiness 101 program helps you break through your limiting beliefs and manifest the abundance and success you desire with fun and ease. Interested? Book a free Happiness 101 exploration call with me, your happiness expert, Samya Bano. Just use my online calendar link in the show notes. Now back to the show.
Well, it's just fascinating. I, I would really love to hear more about uh, your journey um, because I think that these, these personal stories are just so helpful. And and what I what really jumped out at me when, when you were explaining this is how uh, I think there is a difference between a tra trauma traumatic event that mm -hmm. happens to you and and being a victim of trauma so mm -hmm. what, what i mean by that is that something very traumatic can happen um and it can become a trauma because trauma is when you when you carry it when it stays with you mm -hmm. and it becomes so part of your life in a in a triggering and painful way. Um, so in that case, something happened in the past, yeah. but it's constantly in the present with you. And then and then there is this other as other uh, when like other thing when when it's a traumatic event, it happened to you, but through education and seeking help and going through other experiences you grow out of victimhood yes. because somehow you you get an under you gain an understanding of what happened to me um I, I i even suggest that maybe you even learn that some someone who did that to you this person might have been a wounded person in pain like you just gain a better understanding so you have knowledge and then all of a sudden, yes, there was there was trauma in your life, but there's a transformation and you're not a victim anymore. Yes. It's, so I, I I love I love your your story and um, you know, with all the traveling and learning and education, the books. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Yes, no, you, thank you for those insights about, you know, d making the distinction between the incident and then actually the trauma that, you know, what happens is that it, it's what stays with you. Mm -hmm. The incident done and over with, uh, but the memories of it and the, the sense of suffering that you carry with you after, that is really, I agree with you i mean not only does it stay with you and um, hurt you but that is actually the thing that people struggle to heal and uh, and it, it can take people literally decades all their lives even um trying to heal it and it's so difficult if you don't reach out for help and support um because i know like for me as long as i was trying to figure it out on my own it was really 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 difficult i and i was struggling so much and i even got to a point where i was like i just can't do this anymore i cannot figure it out nothing's getting better and i was like either i just give up and end my life or i ask for help and literally yeah. when uh you know it came down to that so uh then as scared as i still was i was like you know i'm going to at least try to ask for help and thank God um, I was able to do that. And actually that would not have been possible either if we hadn't moved. And at that time, by that time I had come to America and I was uh, like, it's now having new opportunities open to me um, uh, in terms of where I could even go to ask for help, you know? And so I'm really, really grateful that I have moved around as much as I did. Yeah, you know, I think that um, you pointed something very important out. Uh, when we are alone with trauma, trauma, the pain, the suffering can grow so huge, so large that you disappear. The person who you are disappears and you become the trauma. You become the pain. And, and... You even mentioned that you know either you end your life like if we look at it isn't it like i, I even i almost see an entity growing so large that it, it it grows above and over your own boundaries and you disappear 
So that's why uh, seeking help and and going through the process and dealing with trauma it's so very important because if if you go through the healing process then the tra the trauma um like we are not going to avoid it it's not that we avoid it or it never happened to me no 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 it's the opposite we can take a look at it and we can even grow as a person because of the not because of the trauma but because of the process because of the self growth because of the learning that this trauma created so there's a huge learning opportunity when yeah. challenges happen to us yes yeah so true that is so true you know i love this idea of post-traumatic growth because you know this was actually one of the things that i discovered in the process of my learning and growth that you know a lot of times even in when you do reach out for help and support a lot of people all of their focus um even at, at a professional level, you know, like a lot of services, for example, here in America, when you reach out for help, a lot of the services that are available are focusing on helping you to recover. And recovery is good. It's really good because there's a lot of people who are struggling even to recover. Uh, but with recovery, the goal is to get you back to where you were before you experienced the traumatic incident and um you know that's really good as a goal definitely as a first goal but what a lot of people don't realize is that it doesn't have to stop there your your growth doesn't have to stop there your learning doesn't have to stop there and your experience of happiness and inner peace etc can also keep growing and so that's where, you know, you can go from beyond recovery to actually thriving. And uh, that's my uh, favorite, favorite part um, now because, um, you know, I, I actually noticed how there was so much focus on recovery, but there wasn't hardly anyone um, focusing on this post-traumatic growth, this this growth from you know recovery to to thriving in your life and that's actually part of why i became a happiness expert because i was like that's where i want to focus my efforts in working totally. i i just couldn't agree more with you and i think that we are here on this earth to grow uh, to become more and more self-aware more and more conscious and and i think that uh, oh gosh, like this is really a passionate area for me, uh, you know, like uh, bringing awareness and love and connection. And I think that um, people grow, so either people get stuck when, when they face challenges and conflicts and trauma, so either they get stuck, but even when they are stuck, they will get depressed or they will start drinking. So I, I know that maybe I'm not so popular with my approach among other therapists because when um, when I meet my clients and someone reaches out to me with depression, anxiety, ADHD, um, addiction issues, I, I, I kind of celebrate that, yay, great, because these are just symptoms telling you that you are not living the life that you could, that you, that you, you, you have some potential in you that is just not a lie, like it's dormant, you know, like, uh, and, and those symptoms like depression is just showing us that, huh, there is something needs to change here. Yeah. It's thri like thriving growth is there. It's possible. And the nervous system, the, your inner wisdom is telling you that, hello, you know, uh, something needs to shift. So I think that, that yes, when we go through conflicts, trauma, challenges, then there is like there's the healing and there's the that, that growth where yeah. you 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 can become some something more. And that's so exciting. Yes.
You know, and I do really have a, a great appreciation for the wisdom of our bodies now, because, you know, oftentimes what happens, um, I've seen this with the clients that I work with, and I've seen this in my own personal experience as well, that sometimes, you know, we are not willing to create the change that we really need, like at a conscious level, or we're maybe really struggling with it uh, for various reasons. And so we may just give up, but it's a change that really we need to really make for our wellness, for our well-being. And so then our subconscious or our heart or, you know, our bodies even themselves will figure out ways to nonetheless try to course correct us. And that's how I experienced when I was going through depression is that, you know, like, um, I wanted to just ignore my trauma. I wanted to just forget about it, act like it never happened. And um, it and that as a strategy worked for a while. But after a while, you know, you really um, need to deal with it. You need to face up to it and, and do the work to heal what needs healing. But when I kept running away from it, kept running away from it, at some point, my body was like, no, Samia, we're not going to let you keep running away. Yeah. And so I actually fell into a deep depression and it just um, literally forced me to stop doing anything with my life because I just lost the motivation to do anything. And, uh, but it forced that um, stop, you know, because otherwise I was just, no, keep going, keep going, keep going, ignoring the trauma, ignoring the trauma. But when the depression hit, it was like, no, you cannot run away anymore. We're not going to let you. And so then that was actually where, as I mentioned, I got to that point where I was like, either I ask for help and change something or, you know, this is it. I can't go on. So um, for me, it became that, you know, serious turning point and my body had to like literally force me to to do it yeah yeah and most of us learn through pain that something becomes so unbearably painful like depression um i've been there as well that the only thing that matters is to do something about it and that's when we gather the courage to face the painful trauma because of course you know there is this part of us that wants to avoid because facing pain um, is painful but avoiding pain it becomes even more painful so when avoidance become becomes more painful than facing <laughs> trauma that's when uh, most of us have the courage and and uh, but after that of course that's where growth happens so and in my book because the book is about relationships romantic relationships at the same time this is the basic idea that we as children we most of us don't receive the um, super unconditional supportive love and uh or or you know school or society like some somehow we suffer trauma <clears throat> and trauma by the way can be even a little thing that you were not seen and heard as a as a child you know so it's not only something that happened to you but also certain things that you didn't receive that your little nervous system needed so what what do children do they they develop coping strategies so for example they become people pleasers or or you know or low victims who are so vulnerable uh, so children figure out you know how to get the attention they need or how to navigate in in the family system or in their society to be accepted to be okay you know so 
So we enter these romantic relationships with a backpack, with all those survival strategies, all the trauma, all the triggers. Triggers are red buttons that when they are pushed or they are being pushed somehow, then we time travel, old stuff just arise. So we, instead of seeing what what's present, what's true in the present moment, old feelings, uh, you know, appear in the body, in yeah. your body, as if you were reliving uh, the old pain. And romantic relationships are the playground of, of this. So, so many times we are able to um, function really well. There's like high functioning people, you know, with great jobs and, uh, you know, they, they go to the gym or whatever they do. And then at home, <laughs> that's, that's where um, we get triggered and, and that's where the old patterns come alive. And then because the because of the lack of knowledge, we think that, oh my God, this is horrible. The other person, we blame the other person. We blame the relationship, that this relationship is so painful. The yeah. relationship is painful. Well, it's not the relationship that's painful. It's old pain being triggered for you and for your partner. And the book speaks about this, that how incredible it is if we take the approach that we could partner up with our spouse or partner or, you know, the person we live with and say that, how about we use this relationship for self-growth? So when we are in a conflict and we are activated, mm -hmm. uh, instead of finding, oh my God, this relationship is so painful, we can take a look at ourselves and say that, oh, so interesting that when he is yelling, I become a little girl and I become a victim. I have this victim mindset that, oh my God, oh, poor me, it's happening to me. Mm. So I can observe myself. I can develop self-awareness What to see what happens in my body, you know, when I'm being triggered. And I can discover that, wow, you know, that comes from my childhood when my dad and mom and whoever was treating me in a certain way. So as a child, I was a victim, but am I a victim now? Is there anything that I can do about it? And and my partner can discover that, oh, um, um, in, in order to protect myself, I, I try to control things or, you know, I get angry or I, I become a people pleaser so that people accept me. So in the relationship, you know, we can discover our old patterns and if we have a partner who is willing to play this with us, uh, then it can become a beautiful, beautiful journey. Wow. Um, so that's the idea of the book. And it's so connected to trauma because all those coping strategies are, we, de we did develop those in childhood because of the trauma, small or big or whatever that we suffer. Yeah. So, Relationships can offer this healing space. Unfortunately, most of the time, the opposite happens. We act out, they act out, everyone acts out, and we basically get re-traumatized. And then we enter a different relationship, and and the person looks different and acts different, but the same things will uh, reoccur. So, yeah. Uh, any, anyway, like that's that's the uh, uh, main idea of the book and and the courses and, um, and and my work when I work with couples to explore how we can grow out of uh, childhood patterns and tra transform the trauma we suffered and wow and get liberated and maybe find who we really are and, and connect on a different level yes that is so beautiful that is really beautiful and you know the the willingness piece that you were talking about the 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 both the partners be willing to engage in this play uh uh you know learning how to grow together and heal together that is so important because i think that um is what a lot of um 
sometimes there's confusion in that, um, you know, like you can't force anyone else to do this or that change in any way, really. Um, so if your relationship is going to work and, um, you know, there really has to be willingness on both sides. And it's like very difficult when one person wants to grow and the other person is not on board with that. Yeah. Um, and that in itself can actually become a cause for conflict and so forth. And so to have this willingness to know, like if you're in a relationship to talk to uh, to your partner about, hey, are you willing to do this with me? Or if you're going to get into a new relationship, to have this in your mind as a criteria to look for someone who would be willing to engage in this play with you. Yeah, I think that's a that's a tough one. Uh, you can find yourself in a relationship and then recognize that when you are already in the relationship that, oh, there's an opportunity um, for growth here and, and then your partner either joins you or not. If your partner doesn't join, uh, well, depending on the, you know, the intensity of the issues two people have, you you are responsible for your own growth. So you can start exploring yourself and change without having expectations. And that might have an impact on, on the other person. But that's very true that it becomes difficult when, when you grow and the other person doesn't. And, um, and then what happens to the relationship? That's a big question mark if the relationship survives or not. If, if you are you know, looking for someone and you are trying to find a part, like, trying to find, like, I mean, if you're single, yeah. uh, then, yeah, I think that it, it's an important criteria. So from my perspective, um, people can arrive to a relationship with all kind of, the people are not perfect. I'm not perfect for sure. Um, for for me, one of the most important criteria is that the other person has already has some self-awareness or has the willingness, the intention to, to self-reflect. Because if, if that's present for both people, then anything, like people can overcome any issues and grow. But if there is this blindness or, or this rejection, then yeah. that's, um, they just everything stops there. Yeah. yeah. That's right. I mean, some people have the attitude of, well, I am who I am, and I'm just going to stay this way. And there's actually an act of resistance that you experience with with these people to creating any kind of change, to creating any kind of growth. And that can become, like, very problematic, especially for someone who does want to grow. So it's important to have this, to be aware of this for yourself and uh, just make sure you're matching your partner. Yeah, yeah. And I think that it's, it's a, um, I, I even suggest that um, self-growth and, and awareness is so, uh, it's not just a, a good thing to have, but it's almost um our chance as you know as humanity to survive because mm. those people who who think that okay this is who i am period i'm that, that's it these are my beliefs these are these are my stories and there's no questioning there's no you know exploration there's no curiosity um then how can be how can you be curious about the other person? How can can you be curious about another culture? And if uh, if people are married to you know a very rigid personality, uh, then of course groups you know families groups social groups are married to a very rigid story. And then of course countries can be married to very rigid stories. And then and then all we see is separation all the time. You know, 
separation yeah. and and uh, and then and we know what happens so without diving into political stuff when there is separation then it's a uh, it's a dead end so i think that that's why uh, when we look at what's you know the, what's happening out there uh, we should take a look at ourselves that am i am i growing am i what can i do so what can i do well, i can develop better relationships with my loved ones yes. and and then demonstrate that that's possible yes this is such an important insight that you have highlighted and uh i mean the things that are you know challenges for us at a personal level they don't just remain uh personal challenges they will impact um our other relationships and after all societies countries entire cultures are made up of individuals and the way that we we are as people individually absolutely shapes the society the the countries the cultures that we are a part of and i mean again having moved around um you know i can attest to this that every nation has a certain personality yeah. you know <laughs> and you like really feel it when you go to a different culture go to a different country and it's not that um everyone is the same but there is like a dominant personality yeah. a dominant culture a dominant way that you experience people doing things and um you know when you move around um you you begin to see that in some ways more clearly than people who have been living there forever and have not moved around because i remember when we lived in india i mean and in our small town i thought that was just how how it was you know and so like for example like as a muslim person I only knew one way to be Muslim and that was the way I experienced it growing up in my small town in India. But when we moved to Dubai, actually a very interesting thing about Dubai is that 80% of the population there is immigrants. And so you have people from pretty much all over the world coming and mixing over there, including Muslims from different parts of the world. and and you know so you that was my first exposure to different muslim cultures and different ways of being muslim and it was like very uh shocking at first but then it became really fun because you know you get to discover different ways that you can be while still you know like for us uh, my family um, we identified as Muslim and we were very, you know, much committed to our identity as Muslims. And so we didn't want to do anything that would be considered un-Islamic or, you know, going against our faith and religion, religion and beliefs. So to discover other ways of being Muslim, other understandings of how Muslims uh, think and can live and be, it was so much fun <laughs> because it just, again, you know, opened up so much while giving us the opportunity to stay in integrity with our identity as Muslims. Yeah, I think it's so exciting to discover um, maybe um, the core message or what you regard as core mm -hmm. of of your religion, and and then discover that some part of the religion is man made, uh, and. Um, and uh, people practice it differently so there is a there's a freedom there's a freedom of who you want to be within the borders boundaries of 
of your own culture. Yes. And that's true about relationships also and the possibilities that open up for you in terms of how to be in relationships because, you know, like uh, a relationship example in terms of changing countries was, again, like, you know, as long as we were in our small town in India, there's one way that we had experience about how to be a family, how to be uh, with each other. Uh, but when we moved, like, especially when we moved to America, my gosh, I think for, in, in some ways, that was like the biggest um, culture shock for us because, you know, as long as we were moving around in Asia, there was certain, I mean, there was definitely differences. Uh, like, uh, other than Dubai, I've also lived in Pakistan, in Asia. But, you know, there's there's a certain collectivistic um, cultural mindset yeah. um in 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 India in Pakistan and in Dubai that I experienced very family oriented very like your identity is more like a group identity focused like a collectivist yes. uh, uh, like collectivist societies for collectivist sure collectivist societies and so it was uh so even though I experienced differences it wasn't until I came to America and experienced the more individualistic culture in America that we really got to see something significantly different in terms of relationships. You know, I remember, for example, um, uh, when we moved here in LA, I was almost 18 years old. Um, and we had family, extended family who was already here. And so when we first came here, we were actually staying with our extended family. So one of my aunts, uh, there were actually like uh, several of my aunts, uncles and cousins all living in close proximity together. And I remember this one day where my aunt and my cousin, um, who was actually even younger than I was at the time, um, they were sitting together, and at some point, uh, my cousin put up her foot uh, towards her mother, and she was like, Mom, my foot hurts. Give me a massage. And her mom started giving her a foot massage, and they, they were like, like, it's completely normal. And, like, for me, I was like, oh, what's going on here? Like, that's never, like, I give my mom foot massages all the time but that's something very appropriate for me as the daughter to do for my mother but uh, to see that happening in reverse was very uh, surprising for me because the way that our relationships work it's like you're not in an equal level with your parents uh, in the traditional Indian culture you're not your parents are authority figures and there is a certain respect that's due to them. And, um, you know, there's, um, like, you serve them. I mean, your parents take care of you in all kinds of ways, but you never, like, I mean, you never have, a, a, you, I mean, like, I never saw something like that. A hierarchy. Where, yes. A hierarchy. Yes. Yes. You would never, you, it would be considered, like, you wouldn't ask someone who is above you as an authority figure to massage your foot for you. You just never do that in our traditional Indian culture. So, you know, it was just very, um, like, a different paradigm, you know, of how you can be in a relationship. And it's like my cousin and her mom had a very good relationship. Like, they were very happy with each other, very easygoing. And... You know, even the, the how they were easygoing with each other and the way that, I mean, they were just so casual with each other. You know, it was just such a different thing for us to see and experience. And uh, again, it just opened up all of these like possibilities for how my family was like, well, how do we want to continue to be as a family? And you know, now, like, uh, uh, the way my family behaves with each other is a lot more relaxed and casual than <laughs> when we were back in India or even Pakistan or even, um, you know, Dubai. 
and it's just um again you know there's something really wonderful about having that choice to to be different um and and to behave in a different way and still know that you are not doing anything wrong by doing things in this different way that you're still you know holding the integrity uh, and the value of the relationship yeah i i think that's uh, that's just such a such a, a great story and uh, i think that that's what these cultures offer where we have so many people from different cultures um that we develop this um ha huh, what is it like this really like we lose the rigidity that things have to be in a certain way yeah. and that's why traveling uh, is so so important and and because it's so easy to think for example that love like if we love each other we need to behave in a certain way so you know there are those love languages for example that some people love giving gifts the other one loves verbal affirmation or not affirmation what what is it is that affirmation like yeah. you know verbal whatever validation yeah. you know this. and uh, just an example that you know when when you were talking about your family i have a um, it's really like my 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 dear dear friends back in in Hungary and they they shout and they 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 keep throwing things around and yell like they're so angry all the time like uh, <laughs> at, at each other you know uh, and at first when I met them I was kind of terrified because it's a very different style like I I don't do that and. <laughs> And I thought, like, I, I thought, that, oh, my God, this is terrible, you know, like, these kids here are being terrorized, or, you know. But you know what, like, as, as I, I, I learn more about them, they are just one of the strongest and most loving family I, I know. They are just loud. They are just really loud. <laughs> and they, they get really loud, and then everyone is really, you know, screaming, but then they... They, they talk about the issues, they solve them, and they move on, and, and there's this really, really strong bond. So for me, that was such a, you know, like a learning experience that what matters is the connection and the love, the form, how it looks like, you know, that, that can be very different. Because so many times people do the right things and say the right things, but there is, there's no real connection. It's just... Yes, it's coexist and and be super respectful and helpful, but there's no real connection underneath. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, you're so right about that. You're so right about that. You know, this is something that I've actually experienced in American corporate culture to the extent that I've been exposed to American corporate culture, where. You know, when when you enter into the professional world, there are certain expectations that are laid on you in terms of how you behave, um, particularly in the context of interacting with uh, uh, customers, but also in how you interact with colleagues. And there are certain certain expectations that are placed upon you. So, for example, if you go to the store, um, any kind of business that is serving customers, you know, there's this saying about the customer is always right. And so there's this expectation that the people who are working behind the counter, uh, you know, will treat you in a very pleasant way, that they'll be smiling. And um, no matter how badly you as a customer might behave, they're expected to put up with it. And, um, you know, just sort of uh, keep the situation calm and um, de-escalate, et cetera. And it, at, at one level, all of that makes sense and it's totally fine. But, you know, what I found kind of disturbing was that, you know, that the behavior of the employees um they meet the expectations, but it's not always coming from a genuine place. 
And so behind the scenes, there is so much uh, unhappy feelings and even anger and dis dissatisfaction that the employees are then, you know, sort of harboring. And um, it's like, um, you know, you, the, you deal with the customer a certain way and you're smiling at them or whatever. As soon as the customer is gone, then you start complaining about this person to your coworker or whoever. And, you know, you're just like wenting about their bad behavior in a sector. And it, it, there is like for me, you know, it creates like this disconnect um, that I don't think is really healthy for us as people to, you know, behave in these ways that, you know, to behave in a way um, that is not really reflective of how we really think and feel and to do that day after day, day after day, day after day, because you're expected to do it. Um, I mean, it just creates so much unhappiness for people. And it's just, I, I mean, I've even experienced um, or witnessed where like literally people are so unhappy, they're actually feeling depressed and, at their work and, but they're still expected to present that happy face. And actually that ends up becoming another cause for why they become more depressed and more unhappy, you know? And it's just like this vicious cycle that they're like, how do you break out of it? Well, that's a great question, how to break out of that. And I think that uh, the whole thing starts um, in childhood <clears throat> when <clears throat> around age two, uh, and especially when kids start going to school, like uh, not just daycare or whatever, but the actual school system, when, when uh, we teach children how to start wearing different space suits. It's, it's, it was Ram Dass who called it a space suit. So put on a persona. So instead of being who you are and um, speaking your truth and express your emotions, um, we teach children how to behave as good girls and good boys. And, uh, you know, like uh, there's so many beliefs that boys don't cry. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's one thing that pops into my mind that boys don't cry. Well, I have a son. He cried a lot. Thank God. He needed to express crying, by the way, just saying, like, uh, do we ever think about why human beings cry? Mm -hmm. Well, why? Because, first of all, with the tears, some toxins um, leave the system. And, and, and crying is an expression of that uh, feeling that they have and then we learn we are taught how to suppress the feelings we have and behave and of course you know like uh, I'm a parent as well and we have the responsibility of teaching certain things to kids we, but it's um, uh, how to behave but at the same time um, when when there's no room for self-expression expressing uh, their true feelings and and having real conversations about why we behave this way. We we, we behave this way uh, with respect. Like, let's say we speak respectfully to our teachers. We do that. But if if um, if there is a, a conflict between the teacher and the child, it's possible that the child can express, talk about their feelings. So I think that what you're talking about starts in childhood. And I think that this is a topic that we could talk yes. hours, you know, hours, because that's where the training, the somebody training, the good citizen, the good uh, employee, the good student starts. And all those kids who don't fit in the box, they are labeled, they're labeled that they have this or that, whatever, uh, they, they, are, they get diagnosed with things mm -hmm. when in fact it's possible that they just have a different way. They, there's this very narrow box that's yes. warm 
Yeah. Either we can squeeze you in that box and uh, you are you you can manage, or you you fall out and then and then you grow up with labels. So I, I know that's a different topic, what you what you brought up, but I think that that the root. Oh gosh, like uh, how to how to deal with what you know what you were talking about. Well, it all starts in childhood. So I think that that's why our responsibility is gaining self-awareness, learning about ourselves, seeing like recognizing our triggers and patterns and see how we pass that on yeah. to the next generation. Yeah. I think that that's so important. And and then of course education. I mean uh, if uh, teachers were educated about emotional health and um, it was part of like oh gosh like it's a huge topic so i don't think that we can dive into it but but yeah i i hear you i totally hear so you so true so true and you know what uh anna i think we'll just have to bring you back so we can keep talking <laughs> i think so oh gosh uh so um but thank you so much for all the wisdom you've shared and uh, very, very interesting insights. And there were actually other questions that were coming to my mind uh, as we were talking that I didn't even get to voice as yet. <laughs> so we have so much more to talk about. But for right now, if you wrap up, do you have any last thoughts uh, to share? Oh, I, I, I don't know. My la last thoughts are that uh, how amazing it is that um, there's so many topics we can talk about yeah. and there's so many things that need to be explored and changed. And, and, and I'm just so grateful for, for this conversation and so grateful for the passion you have and the passion I have for, for these things and, and, and bringing and, 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 thank you for doing what you do because you are bring, bringing awareness to the most important topics how change is so needed by the way change is the only thing that is constant is change and uh, and make it fun and uh, learning you know educating ourselves and and uh, it's just so so important so i just want to express my gratitude i think that those are my last thoughts yeah Thank you so much anna and uh, my last reminder to our listeners is to please make sure you check the show notes because i will be dropping anna's links in the show notes you can connect with her even check out her book and until we connect next time i just wish you lots and lots of peace and joy